Hello, and thank you for joining us for part three of our four-part intellectual property basics series. This workshop series is being presented through a collaborative partnership between the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center and the UA Little Rock William H. Bowen School of Law Business Innovations Clinic. I'm Brett Harris, a Rule 15 student attorney at the Bowen School of Law. And I'm Kim Vudin, Assistant Professor of Clinical Education and the Director of the Business Innovations Clinic at the Bowen School of Law. The information provided in this presentation does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice. Instead, all information, content, and materials shared in this presentation are for general informational purposes only. Information presented in this presentation may not constitute the most up-to-date legal or other information. This presentation contains links to third-party websites and materials. Such links are only for the convenience of the attendee, user, or observer. UA Little Rock does not endorse the content of third-party sites. In this presentation, we will discuss the definition of a copyright, how ownership of a copyright is established, an overview of the benefits of copyright registration, copyright licensing and assignment agreements, the definition and common myths associated with copyright infringement, and the fair use doctrine. To recap, copyright is one of four major legal tools commonly used in intellectual property. For more information about trademarks, patents, or trade secrets, please view our other toolkit videos on each of these topics accessible on the websites of ASBTDC and the Business Innovations Clinic. Let's start with the pop quiz. True or false? Works are protectable by copyright so long as the author can articulate what the work is. False. As you will soon learn, material must be fixed in a tangible medium in order to receive copyright protection. They cannot be just ideas. So what exactly is a copyright? A copyright is a property right that protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a physical or tangible form. Copyrights serve as a means to prevent others from using an author's work without permission or compensation to the author. Now let's break down the definition of copyright, starting with what an original work is. In the context of copyright law, original works are created by a human author and possess at least some minimal degree of creativity. A minimal degree of creativity can be something as simple as the author's unique layout or arrangement of a compilation of existing works. In fact, you might be surprised to learn that compilations, such as a phone book, may be eligible for copyright protection because the act of selecting the layout and organizing the information meets this minimal degree of creativity threshold. Next, let's look more closely at what works of authorship can be, with some examples. Works of authorship are the types of works that are eligible for copyright protection. Literary works include written works such as poems, novels, academic writings, or fiction. The Harry Potter series of books would be considered a literary work. Musical works include song lyrics and underlying musical compositions. For example, the lyrics to I Will Always Love You written by Dolly Parton would be considered musical works. Dramatic works include plays, musicals, and other th theater type productions. So here, think of the Broadway musical Hamilton. Pantomimes and choreographic works in modern times primarily consist of recorded choreography, but still do include pantomimes, which are speechless performances using physical gestures. The choreography in The Nutcracker would qualify as a choreographic work. Pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works are what most would call fine arts, including paintings, photographs, and sculptures. So here, you can think of Georgia O'Keeffe's Glen Canyon painting. Motion pictures and audiovisual works include works such as movies and any type of work that includes graphics and accompanying audio which are synced together. An example would be the Disney movie Coco. Sound recordings are basically any type of audio recording, whether it be a particular recorded song, a recorded speech, or even recordings of natural sounds. 
Whitney Houston's recording of I Will Always Love You and an audio recording of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech would both be considered a sound recording. Architectural works protect certain unique and distinct architectural designs created by architects. Here, think of the unique building designs such as the One World Trade Center in New York City. Last, and arguably most important, let's examine what it means to be fixed in a tangible form. In practical terms, this just means that the work must be recorded in a manner so that the author could share the exact work with others. This sharing can be done physically or electronically. Therefore, a work is considered recorded not only when it's written on a piece of paper, but also when it is a saved file on a hard drive or a server. The key concept from the requirement of being fixed in a tangible form is that the work has to be actually recorded and not just a mere idea in somebody's head. There are several types of works that are commonly mistaken as being protectable when in fact they are not. Some of the most common examples of such mistakes include but are not limited to common recipes or discoveries of existing things in nature. Here. Think of an ingredient list and basic preparation instructions, or the discovery of a plant that has been growing in a rainforest. Works that are not fixed in a tangible form also cannot be protected by copyright. Here again, ideas or concepts are not protectable. So if I have a tune in my head that I have hummed out loud, it cannot be protected by copyright until I record it on my phone or write the composition down on paper. Titles, names, short phrases, and slogans cannot be copyrighted either. Here, think of business names or even band names, or even famous slogans. Take for instance the slogan, Just Do It. While the slogan's use as a logo is trademark protected, Nike cannot stop anyone from saying, or singing, or writing, Just Do It in a speech, or a book of poems. Mere variations of ornamentation, lettering, or other stylings. Here, changing the font on the work or changing the styling of content does not meet the minimal degree of creativity needed for copyright. Let's say someone decided to make posters with an excerpt from Harry Potter printed on them, but using fancy Old English style font. That reproduction is a copyright infringement, even though the poster uses a different font from the books. It's time for another quick pop quiz. True or false, you own copyright in any works you exclusively create as part of your job. Under most circumstances, the correct answer is false. Work product created by you as an employee is typically owned by your employer. This type of work is referred to as a work made for hire. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but usually it will be accompanied by a contract or writing clarifying such. Speaking of copyright ownership, how do you know if you have a copyright? The answer to this question is relatively simple. Copyright is created at the time of the work is first fixed in a tangible form. In practical terms, this just means that you have own a copyright as soon as you first record the work in a form that can be shared with others. This means that you do not have to register your work with the Federal Copyright Office in order to actually own a copyright. In context of creating things for an employer, as we just discussed, copyright of a work product made in the course of employment is typically owned by the employer. This means that the individual does not own the copyright of the work product, but rather your employer owns the copyright. For more specific information regarding works made for hire, please see our accompanying toolkit for copyrights. So, you may be asking yourself now, well, who actually owns copyright in a work created by multiple people? In other words, what if two people got together to write an article? The answer here is that copyright can be owned by more than one person. For example, if three people write a song's lyrics together with the intention of it being a single work, all three individuals own copyright in the joint work. Joint work authors each have all the rights afforded to the work, the same as a single copyright owner would. 
If multiple people contribute to a work, but with the intent of their work being separate and independent, then the work is considered a co-authored collective work. Encyclopedias and photography anthologies are good examples of this because the individual contributors retain copyright of their individual contributions, but not to the work as a whole. So what rights do you get when you own a copyright? Think of copyright as a bundle of sticks. It is a type of property right made up of a number of different rights. In general, copyright grants rights to reproduce the work, distribute copies of the work, perform the work publicly, make a derivative work, and display the work publicly. The owner of this bundle of sticks can remove a single stick and give it to somebody else while still holding on to the rest of the sticks. This is very much analogous to copyright because the copyright owner can license a work to one party to reproduce it and sell it to the general public, while the copyright owners can still maintain its rights to license to anyone else. It's time for another pop quiz. True or false? In order for a work to be protected by copyright, the work must be registered with the Federal Copyright Office. If you said false, you're correct. Registration with the U.S. Copyright Office is not required in order to have copyright protection. However, as you will see in the next slide, there are several reasons why you should consider registering your copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office. Arguably one of the most important benefits of copyright registration is that it enables you to pursue legal enforcement of your copyright. In fact, you must have a copyright registration in order to pursue copyright infringement claims against another party. Another benefit is the fact that registration puts the public on notice that a particular work is protected by copyright. Additionally, timely copyright registration provides access to additional remedies in infringement claims such as statutory damages, which are specifically named dollar amounts for infringement and recovery of attorney's fees. If you haven't registered the copyright yet, when you find out that someone else is violating your right, you have six months from when you discovered the infringement to register. Thinking back to the bundle of sticks analogy, you may have wondered how individual rights or sticks can be given to others. One of the most common methods of temporarily letting someone borrow a stick or right is to create a licensing agreement. A licensing agreement is an agreement that gives somebody the right to utilize a work for certain purposes. These agreements often require the party receiving the temporary usage right to compensate the owner. A common type of payment associated with licensing agreements is a royalty. Royalties are paid to the copyright owner for usage of the work and are typically calculated as a percentage of profits generated from the use of the mark. If the copyright owner wishes to permanently transfer their copyright to somebody else, this is done through a copyright assignment. A copyright assignment must be made in writing and signed by the copyright owner. It is also important to note that copyright assignment can also be made through a will or through probate of an estate. A common mistake that business owners make is not obtaining copyright ownership of works created by graphic designers. This is why it is generally a good idea to always obtain a copyright assignment for any work produced by graphic designers or other non-employees. Over the past 20 years, copyright infringement has achieved mainstream household fame with the takedown of peer-to-peer -peer music sharing platforms such as Napster and LimeWire. So what exactly is copyright infringement? Copyright infringement is the act of using, copying, and or distributing copyrighted materials without permission from the copyright owner. It's important to note here that a lack of intent or knowledge of infringing activities is not an excuse. In other words, saying, I didn't know, is not a legal defense. So what are some common infringement activities? Some common examples include photocopying literary works such as poems without permission or payment of royalties, 
photocopying sheet music for choirs without permission or payment of royalties, illegal downloading of music and movies, selling counterfeit goods, and covering a song without paying royalties. In addition to common infringing activities, there are also several common infringement myths that are widely believed to be true. For example, many people believe that you can use up to 30 second clips of copyrighted songs without infringing on the work. This is completely untrue as any direct copying of work is copyright infringement. Similarly, many people believe that so long as you're using less than 10% of a copyrighted work, it is an infringement. Again, this simply is false. Remember, any direct copying without permission is infringement. Another common myth is that you can freely use any work that is not labeled as being copyrighted. In modern law, this is completely untrue because copyright exists at the time a work is first fixed and registration is not required for protection. Lastly, people often believe they are in the clear with copying something so long as, the, as they credit the work. Again, if there was no permission or royalties agreed to, there is copyright infringement, regardless if a printed credit was put out there. It's time for another pop quiz. John, a professional photographer, captured what has now become an iconic photograph of a national park approximately 10 years ago. John never registered his photograph for copyright protection. A company began selling his photograph on canvases roughly eight years ago without John's permission. John can bring suit against the company for copyright infringement today, true or false? Here, if you answered false, you are correct. John must first receive copyright registration before pursuing litigation. Additionally, a potential issue exists even after registration is granted if John knew about the infringement and chose to do nothing about it for an extended period of time. Often, you'll hear individuals state that their use of copyright material is fair use. So, what exactly is fair use? In short, Fair use refers to the fair use doctrine, which is a defense against a copyright infringement claim. The fair use doctrine permits use of copyrighted works without the owner's consent for purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. While at face value, these permissible uses may seem very broad, they are in fact very narrowly construed so as to apply only very to only very specific purposes. As we just mentioned, the fair use doctrine is a defense to a claim of copyright infringement. This is particularly important to emphasize because fair use is not determined until litigation has commenced and therefore what is or is not fair use is entirely judge determined. To determine if an activity is fair use, courts use the following balancing test, which looks at each factor with equal weight to determine if altogether the factors weigh toward a finding of fair use. These factors are, one, whether the character of use is commercial or for nonprofit educational purposes, two, whether the work is more creative or factual, three, the amount of the work used in relation to the work as a whole, and four, whether the use causes potential economic harm to the work's owner. Some clear-cut examples of fair use would be if a professor took portions of a song or movie and wrote a critique or analysis. Also, library digitization of printed materials is another clear-cut example. More famously, parodies such as comedy shows like Saturday Night Live and South Park are also clear-cut examples of fair use. Copyright registration is relatively easy to obtain online using US, the U.S. Copyright Office website at copyright.gov backslash registration. At the time of filing for registration, you'll be required to submit two copies of your work's best edition for deposit in the United States Library of Congress. 
The best edition of a work is typically the edition of the work that you consider final and plan on publicly distributing. Most new copyrights created after January 1, 1978 are typically protected for the life of the author plus 70 years after the death of the author. For works that were created before January 1, 1978, the duration varies based on several additional factors which can be found on the U.S. Copyright Office's website at copyright.gov. Works made for hire are protected for the shorter of 95 years from the date of first publication or 120 years from the creation of the work. After a copyright expires, the work enters what is called the public domain. Works in the public domain are free for use by anybody without compensation to the original copyright holder. Red Registering copyrights is relatively inexpensive compared to other IP tools such as patents and trademarks. With the assistance of an attorney, you can expect to pay anywhere from $250 to $500 or more for registration. If you decide to file for copyright protection without an attorney, the filing fees are $45 for a single work and $65 for works made for hire or joint authored works. Next in this video, we'll go through the registration process. The process of submitting an application for registration of a copyright is fairly simple. First, start by visiting the United States Copyright Office's website at copyright.gov. From the homepage, scroll down to the Features section, which includes quick access links to some of the most utilized services of the U.S. Copyright Office. To register your work, you will click Learn More under Register Your Works. Once you click this link, you will be directed to a landing page for copyright registration information, which includes information about common types of works of authorship and a link to the Electronic Copyright Office Registration System, which is referred to as ECO. Click the login link for the ECO system. From there, you will likely be asked to either log in to your existing ECO account or create a new account. Once you are logged into the system, you will be directed to the ecosystem homepage. Central to the homepage is a table listing information about all open applications you have submitted. To register a new work, we look to the left-hand menu labeled Copyright Registration. Here, you see links to several different types of copyright registration applications. Pay close attention to ensure that you click the correct link to the registration type that you need for your work. For illustrative purposes, we will be registering one work by one author. The first question the application asks is for the type of work. For this illustration, I will be registering a poem, which is a literary work. Once you have selected the type of work, you'll notice that additional information about the type of work and examples of that type of work appear. Review the information closely to ensure that you have selected the proper type of work. At the bottom of this page, you're required to acknowledge that you have read the description and that it accurately describes the work you are seeking to register. Next, you must enter the title of the work. Next, you will be asked if the work has been published. Depending on your answer, the system will prompt you for additional information. Here, we are assuming that the work has been published, so we must enter the year of creation and the date of publication. Next, you must enter the author's information. At the bottom of the page, select one poem.
Next, if your work is based off of another work, um, otherwise referred to as a pre-existing work, you're required to submit disclaimer information about the use of the pre-existing work on this page. Next, you can enter contact information for the public to use as a point of contact for permission to use a work. This step is optional. Next, you are required to enter contact information that the United States Copyright Office will use as a point of contact should any questions about the application arise. Next, you need to enter contact and mailing information for the certificate of registration to be delivered to you. If you need special handling or expedited processing, you can select those options on this page. Please note that additional filing fees will be incurred for selection of these options. Last, you must certify that you are the true owner of the copyright and that you are seeking registration by signing your name electronically. After signing, you will be directed to this screen where all of the information you entered is shown. You should carefully review this information to ensure its accuracy. From here, you are ready to file the application by adding it to your card and paying the applicable filing fees. We've covered a lot of material throughout this presentation. So now let's end things by taking a look at some of the important takeaways from this presentation. First, copyright exists at the time the work is physically fixed. Second, copyright includes several rights which can be individually used exclusively by the author sold, or even leased. Third, obtaining federal copyright protection is very important because it's required to pursue copyright infringement litigation. Let me try that again. Third, obtaining federal copyright registration is very important because it's required to pursue copyright infringement litigation. Last, you should always be aware of potential infringing activities so as to avoid potential copyright infringement lawsuits. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this presentation. For more specific information about copyrights, please visit copyright.gov. For more information about trademarks or patents, please visit USPTO.gov. If you would like more information or to connect with the Arkansas Small Business Technology and Development Center or the Business Innovations Clinic, please follow the links shown here.